already know it. There's gonna be some women that's gonna be upset with me on this one. Hey, Smart Christians, welcome back. Again, my name is Corey Miner, and if you haven't done so already, please remember to touch the subscribe button just one time. Uh, also, remember to like this video. If you have any questions or comments, I'm pretty sure on this video you might. Uh, please remember to leave a comment or question uh, in the comment section. Last week's question was one that gets kind of controversial. Uh, it's, it gets ignored um, by many, but the answer to the question is found in the Bible, and that is, can women biblically be pastors? So it's interesting to hear the answers to a lot of people. Uh, obviously, I guess some folks are influenced by uh, their gender. Some are influenced by their age. But the answer to the question biblically is no. Some people just won't like that. That won't sit well with them because after all, uh, what can a man do that a woman can't do? Well, I mean, let's be honest. Let's not be too politically correct. There are differences between men and women, but the physical difference and other differences, those aren't the reasons necessarily why the Bible forbids women. Uh, the Bible is clear when dealing with who can be a pastor, who can be an elder, who can be a presbyter or a bishop, according to the scriptures. So let's go there. First Timothy 3 lays out the qualifications for someone hoping or wanting to go into this office of what we call today a pastor. The issue stems from what Paul says in 1 Timothy, what he says in Titus, what he says in 1 Corinthians, among, among others. And also some people want to bring in what he, what he states in Galatians. And some people seek to kind of downplay Paul's words because it doesn't quite fit what they want to do. But that's not how we handle scripture, is it? Just because it says something that we don't like or disagree or even understand, does, it does not give us a reason to nullify or to ignore those scriptures altogether. If Paul uh, is right and all scripture is God-breathed, then his are as well. And we know that Peter gives validity to Paul's writings as being scripture and Peter walked with Christ. So if anyone wants to downplay Paul, you certainly can't downplay Peter. And so Paul's writing states this in 1 Timothy 3. Let's read. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone desires or aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Very important there. Verse 3. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must be able or must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church of God? Then he goes on to say that he must not be a recent convert and must have a, a good reputation outside of the church. But the focus is going to be uh, this issue of he must be a, the husband of one wife and he uses the uh, the term for wife the Greek term that indicates he's speaking about a female and then Andra the the Greek term indicating that he's speaking about a man the same holds true in Titus as well the problem comes in where some people also don't like the verbiage that's used in first Timothy chapter 2 let's look at that verse 8 he says I desire then that in every place that men should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling the word that's used there isn't mankind uh, the generic sense it is literally the word andros which is the word meaning male or man and so he's he's speaking specifically to men and what he wants he says in verse he says in verse 9 likewise so he's speaking about men then he says likewise going and dealing with women he says in verse 9 also that women should adorn themselves in a respectable apparel with, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold of pearls or costly attire. Let's stop there for a second. Some women are going to say, well, uh, clearly this must be a cultural issue because he's talking about uh, them wearing braids and so forth. And they should, if they shouldn't do that then, then why do we allow it now? Certainly we're not saying that women can't have braided hair today. Well, there is a point to why they wore braided hair then that's not present here today. It made a statement about you that you were trying to uh, allure men 
to you that you were kind of putting yourself out there. It represented that you had a status that was above men, a rank that was above men, and that you did not have any sort of desire to be under any sort of male headship. And so that's not what braids mean today. So is he still speaking culturally? Well, no, let's keep reading. Skipping down to verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain silent. He doesn't mean remain silent as though that once they enter into or come around in the congregation, they can't speak, they can't say anything. That is not Paul's point. You got to shut up. No, that's not what he's saying. He's speaking in terms of leading. I do not permit her to teach or to have authority over a man. That was his whole point. You can argue with it, you can fight with it, but again, this is not necessarily Paul's point, it's God's point. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 13, because or for, Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. He's referring back to what happened in the garden. God pronounces these sentences on mankind. He pronounces sentence on all of the earth as well. And so now we live in this fallen world and there are consequences for their actions, right? The consequence for Adam and Eve, all of mankind is that we're no longer going to live forever. We're going to die and return back to the ground. And in that, the man, you are going to work for everything. The ground is not going to just yield up uh, a harvest, a bountiful harvest of fruit is going to have thorns and thistles, you're going to have to work your tail off, right? And then for the woman, it says that your desire shall be after him. You're going to, it's almost like there's going to be this struggle, this battle uh, between you and him. It has not been the case going forward from, from then up till now, there's been this battle. And some men have kind of overstepped their bounds and have, have kind of gone too far where they want every woman to be submissive to them. That was never the case. Um, but just in terms of, of, of order as it relates to the church, uh, as it relates to how things are to take place, there is this, this, this uh, level of leadership where it is the males who lead the church services, who lead the congregation, and not the women. At least as it pertains to having some sort of leadership over men, to teach over men. Somebody may point to, well, what about... Uh, these other prophetesses and so forth. Well, being a prophetess doesn't necessarily mean that you are in leadership. That's never been the case. A, p a person can prophesy uh, in the Old Testament uh, that necessarily connote that you are a, um, a leader over someone or in the New Testament. And so when you look at uh, when Deborah prophesied, yeah, but that was to the shame of the men. As a matter of fact, she said so. Because if men don't step up, then God will use a woman. But that doesn't mean that, that she is supposed to take the authority away from man. And so he says, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man. And so when you see women like a, like a Beth Moore who wants to do so, who leaves the SBC um, because the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, because she's not in agreement with how women are not allowed to lead. Uh, you see other women who are pastors of their church, Paula White and so forth. And of course, you also end up seeing when you start messing up on one element of doctrine, soon other elements of doctrine are going to start falling. You'll start allowing all, all types of uh, uh, ungodly things in the church. When you start eh, fudging a little bit on this doctrine, that's okay, that's okay, we don't, we're going to reject that. You'll start rejecting other elements of the gospel as well. But Paul is clear here that a woman cannot be a pastor. And he, of course, he takes his cues from, from God. Does that mean that women cannot have um, any sort of role in church, in ministry? Obviously they can. Uh, as a matter of fact, you see uh, how women have in many cases supported and held up the church uh, when men have decided to, to abandon it. God is going to keep this church going and he's going to always have men around. Uh, unfortunately, though, it's always seemed to be the woman who has kind of kept this thing going. I mean, when, when they left uh, at the first sight of trouble, these male apostles decided to, to, <laughs> to scatter, right? All of them took off except for John. John. John hung out. He was the youngest. John was there with the women, but the women were there. Who came to the tomb at the, uh, at the first opportunity? It, were, it was the women. But even still, Jesus did not pick a woman to be an apostle. He did not name, there was not a woman named uh, in place of Judas's death. And so, nor were there any um, 
uh, women named to to lead in the Old Testament. And so you do see women having a role, but it's just but it's just not that role as a pastor. And so it's not an issue of ability or gift. I heard uh, 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 Tony Evans put it this way. Let's say a small Volkswagen is going down the highway in the right lane and then coming up the on ramp is a 18 wheeler. Well, the 18 wheeler has the power to knock over the Volkswagen, but it's not an issue of power or ability. It's an issue of what's right. Who has the right of way? And in this case, the Volkswagen. Similarly, in the Bible, in the scriptures, uh, God has set an order or the right of way that is in this case is going to be the man. So some people aren't going to like it. Uh, I'm not going to apologize because, again, it's not my words. I don't have to apologize for them. Take it up with God. Uh, but if you want to live by every precept, by every jot and tittle of his word, then that requires you to adhere to that as well. Amen. Next week's question is this. Is this, this requires a little bit of kind of thinking. The Bible says that the earth was created in six days. How do we know the earth was created in a literal six days? Think about it. Take some time, do your research. And then on next week, we'll answer the question.